Greetings chemistry students. Today we're going to start our video lecture series for chapter 5, the periodic table. Um, this chapter has a lot of history and a lot of patterns and trends, so please make sure you're carefully following along, listening to the videos, and taking down your own notes. So let's start with textbook chapter um, 5.1, history of the periodic table. We already watched the video in class, and now we're going to go through and look at how Mendeleev organized his table and what kind of improvements were made on it as time went on. So for Mendeleev's periodic table, he organized it by periods and by groups. Periods um, are organized going across with increasing atomic mass, and groups are vertical columns in atomic weight order. I want to make sure we just make a general note, periods are horizontal. So they go across, there's like the rows, so is it horizontal or rows? And then groups are the vertical columns. If you have trouble memorizing that, um, think about this. Horizontal is derived from the word horizon, where the sky meets land or water. It actually comes from the Greek word um, horizon, or kouklos, meaning limiting circle. And then vertical columns support buildings. Vertical derives from the Latin word verticalis, from vertex meaning the crown of a head. And another fun way to remember is that rows go across. You have to row, row, row across the row, and columns go up and go down. Just make sure you keep those separate in your head. Mendeleev made some ex exceptions to place elements in rows with similar properties. So he wasn't always exactly following the rule that he made up. When things seemed like they were out of place, he allowed that to happen and put them into different categories. For example, tellurium and iodine's places were switched. They broke the order. If you check your modern periodic table, the mass of tellurium is 127, and the mass of iodine is 126. 6.9. So if you looked at his rule with increasing mass across the period, the order should go iodine and tellurium. If you look at the modern periodic table, it actually goes tellurium then iodine. Um, Mendeleev knew that this broke his rule, but he knew that iodine had very similar properties to the other things in its column, like bromine, fluorine, and fluorine, while tellurium fit in better with this column. So Mendeleev, he was quite the rule breaker. Other key point that we need to know is that vertical columns have similar chemical properties. That is a really key, a key fact here. Um, what he actually was discovering was that vertical columns have the same number of valence electrons. He didn't even know about electrons yet. Thompson hadn't done his famous cathode ray tube experiment, but he was picking up on those chemical properties which are influenced by the valence electrons. Here is where Mendeleev's genius lays. He left room for missing elements. He left gaps in his table, and he actually even predicted the properties of those yet-to-be-discovered elements. He told all the other scientists, you just haven't worked hard enough yet. If you keep looking, you will find elements with these properties, X, Y, and Z, whatever those could be. Um, he was proved correct three different times. Scandium, germanium, and gallium were all discovered after he said they would be with very, very similar properties to what he had predicted. Um, since Mendeleev's time, we've added some more groups to the periodic table. Um, for example, he did not discover the noble gases. And why do you think that might be? Well, the noble gases are largely unreactive. They weren't discovered until much later um, when technology improved. He also did not know about the lanthanides and the actinides. If you look at your periodic table, those are the bottom two rows right here. A lot of those are also called the rare earth elements. They are very rare. They occur in very, very small quantities, and the second row, the actinide series, those are all radioactive, so not, not that common to have, to have existed and to be looking for when Mendeleev was working. So just know this is the F block, lanthanides and actinides, and noble gases, group 18, that's the last column on the periodic table. There were some unanswered lingering questions. Why didn't some elements fit in order of increasing atomic mass? That's looking back at the tellurium and the iodine problem. And also, why? What was the underlying reason? Why did these elements exhibit the periodic behavior? We saw in the video, we had the octaves, every eighth element, things repeat. Why could that be? So with all these unanswered questions, we needed some new technology. So looking at periodic law, protons and atomic number. Mendeleev didn't know about electrons and he certainly didn't know about protons or neutrons. X-ray experiments revealed a way to determine the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom. It was then revealed that the periodic table was found to be in atomic number order, not atomic mass order. 
um, just a note, this was what Mosley discovered at the end of our video, and this gave us the answer to our tellurium iodine problem. So if you look up the number of protons, you'll find that tellurium has 52 protons and iodine has 53 protons. So if we look at that order, yes, tellurium should come before iodine. So if you really look at that, it goes 52 to 53. It is not by atomic mass order. In general, atomic mass does increase across a period, but there are a couple little blips um, where elements are flip-flopped, and it's because that they actually go in atomic number order. So now let's talk about the periodic law. So periodicity, the physical and chemical properties of the elements are periodic functions of their atomic numbers. That means that they repeat, that's what the periodic function means, and it repeats based on their atomic number. Um, like the activity with the element cards. We may or may not have done that in class yet, but we will soon. Let's move on to section 5.2, electron configurations and the periodic table. So electron configuration in groups. Elements can be stored into noble gases, representative elements, transition metals, or inner transition metals based on their electron configurations. And I'm gonna give you a real quick way to remember this. The representative elements, that is the S and the P block from the periodic table that we've learned about. The transition metals, those are all in the D block. And then the inner transition, also called the rare earth, that's the F block. So make a note that the inner transition, another name for that is the rare earth. You'll see them both pretty common. And noble gases, those are going to be in column number 18. And I've just flipped back to some of the pictures we had when we were doing our coloring the periodic table activity. So we see the main group elements or the representative elements in the S and the P block, transition metals, and we've got the lanthanides, actinides. We can call that the rare earth or the inner transition. Um, here is a way you should probably have color coded your own periodic table. This is the S block. Here we have the P block, the D block, and the F block. And we will come back to that and look at some of the um, charges, other things we can do about that. So let's go through and talk about some of the main points you should know about noble gases. Noble gases are in column 18, or the old name for that, it used to be called 8A, Roman numeral 8, so VIII 8A. They're all the elements in group 18, that's column 18. The key fact is that these all have a filled outer shell. That means that they are largely unreactive. They don't want to gain or lose electrons. So just like the nobles in France didn't want to mess around with the commoners, noble gases don't react with other elements. So for example, helium ends with 1s2, it has two valence electrons. Neon ends with 2p6. Argon ends with 3p6. And argon ends with 3p6. If we're really looking at this, how do all of these noble gases end? These all end with something S2, something P6. So if we look at this, how many valence electrons do they have? They are going to have eight valence electrons. So noble gases have eight valence electrons. But what about our guy helium over here? It only has two electrons, so it only can have two valence electrons. Um, so helium's an exception. You can see why it's still stable. It only has that S orbital. There is no P orbital possible in the first energy level. So helium's happy and completely satiated with just two valence electrons. Let's talk about the representative elements. Another name for representative is also called the main group. And here we are filling the S and the P orbitals. So this is, um, if we go back to my picture I had for you, uh, let's see right here. So main group elements, column one, column two, skip the whole D block, column 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Those are the main group or the representative elements. Um, these electrons are where the valence electrons come from. So if you add them up in the S and P orbitals, you will figure out exactly how many valence there are. Transition elements, those are filling the D block. That's in the center part of your periodic table. And then the inner transition elements filling the F block. Remember, this one's kind of funny. It has a, several different names. We can call these the rare earths, the rare earth metals. We also can call them the lanthanide and actinide series. So if we go back to here, just make sure lanthanides, actinides, or rare earth. Okay, now let's look, go, go through and look at metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. 
So across a period, elements become less metallic and more non-metallic. What that means is elements on the left of the periodic table are metals and elements towards the right are non-metals. So in general, we've got metals towards the left and we have non-metals over here on the right. That's our general rule. So let's look at our several groups of metals that we have. If you look at your periodic table, column one, also known as column 1A. That is the first column on the periodic table. That is right here. These are called the alkali metals. So column 1, 1A. Those also have one valence electron. And these are called the alkali metals. Um, key thing to know about alkali metals, they are very explosive, and I will show you some of them um, in lab during this unit. Next group of metals we have is column 2, or we used to call this old column 2A. These all have two valence electrons, and these are called the alkali earth metals. So they are the alkali earth metals. So if you want to go back to your periodic table, these ones are all right here, and these are called alkali earth. Um, let's look at the blocks in the periodic table. So we have alkali metals and we have alkali earth metals, and the key important thing to know right here is that this is the S block. So right here in yellow, oh, I can write with my highlighter. This is, nope, not going to work. Okay. Go back to the, the pen. So this is the S block. Okay. Now let's go and look at our next group of metals. So our next group of metals, um, these are in columns 3 through 12. Um, they're old names. Don't worry about those. There's all different Roman, Roman numerals for those. But main thing you need to know is that these all have, I'm going to say, two valence electrons. We haven't got there yet. Um, probably next chapter, we're going to see why there's going to be some exceptions to that. And these are called the transition metals. These are what you would classically think of as your everyday metals. So let's look at those right here. So three all the way through 12, and these are our transition metals. The transition metals right here. And if we want to look at what electron block that ends with, I'm going to go green here. So from chapter four, what part of the periodic table is this? This is the D block. So right here in green, we have the D block. So we got the D block here, and we have the S block here. Now, if I go back, let's make that note here as well. So the alkali and alkali metals, alkali earth metals, make up the S block. The transition metals, these are the D block when it comes to electron configurations. And then let's try and get in two more. We have the lanthanides and we have the actinides. So we have lanthanides. And we have the actinides. Um, technically, these are both in column 13. It's that really kind of funny inset part of the periodic table. We have two different names. We call these inner transition because they're inset into the transition metals. Or we also can call these the rare earth metals. And the key part for these is that these are all in the F block. So let's go back to our periodic table and let's label where those are. So these are my inner transition. Also called the rare earths. And this down here is the F block when it comes to electron configurations. So I'm going to block that one out for you. 
Um, let's do blue, why not? So here is our F clock. Now we're running out of time on this first recording. I'm going to pick up looking at nonmetals, metalloids, and classifications on our next video.